Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here to start this uh, this study group. And you know, on the outset, of course, the topic, as you know, I mean, just kind of looking, thinking about uh, human rights in the Middle East and North Africa today, and that's not an easy one to wrap our minds around, given everything that's going on today and everything that's gone on in the last five or six years, in particular. And I've been trying to think about these issues and, and think about what's next for our human rights work. I've been involved in the region in doing human rights work for around 30 years. So in a way, part of that in beginning of the human rights movement in the region uh, and, you know, and seeing it grow and develop and trying different tactics and strategies and thinking we're just about to move ahead on certain issues here only to fall back, um, you know, a month later, a year later, two years later, etc. Uh, we're faced with a lot of huge, huge challenges in the region. And they're challenges of authoritarian government, they're challenges of armed conflict and civil war, they're challenges of an inequitable international economic and political system an undemocratic international political system, never mind our own democracies within the region or the lack thereof, uh, social and cultural challenges, challenges from, uh, you know, interpretations of Islam that say, you know, we have nothing to do with this, etc. And I've been trying to reflect about all of these issues and think, well, what's next? And this opportunity to, to be with you and, and do a few sessions Along, along those lines, uh, just gives us a chance to, to unpack some of the ideas. And a lot of those ideas uh, come out of kind of a, a, a chapter that just I had written that on this book that just came out. Uh, my understanding is that they haven't received it yet here. It's been ordered, <laughs> but hasn't yet been received. So uh, look for it. It's the Rutledge Handbook on Human Rights and the Middle East and North Africa, edited by Anthony Chase. It's got about 34, 35 chapters from different authors. Many people have been involved for a long time. And, um, uh, you know, and many perspectives, many approaches. There's a lot of discussion about Islam and human rights. There's a lot of discussion about political economy, uh, of the region in, from a human rights perspective, etc. The chapter that I wrote really forms the basis for our discussion group. And if you noted from the announcement, uh, we have four sessions, and, and I've divided the sessions basically as the argument that I make in the chapter flows, in the hope that you know, in our discussions, we can unpack some of those questions that I asked, some of those ideas, and the proposals that that proposal proposal comes out uh, at the end. And the thesis goes, uh, or it comes out, it com comes into four sets of four questions. Each question uh, opens a whole can of beans about what we can think about and what we need to unpack. The first one, which is today's topic, is this question or this idea that, you know, let's understand human rights to begin with. You know, is it a feel-good politics? Is human rights just a matter of international standards? Where did they come from? Who set those up? Says who that there is such a thing as you know, a, a standard for human dignity. So, and, and this, the argument I make is that, in fact, the difficulty with human rights and, and trying to get progress on human rights is that it does straddle three spheres. The moral, ethical, cultural sphere, the sphere of conviction, if you will. I'm convinced this is true, this is good, this is correct, and this is right. Uh, and then there is the legal sphere, and then there's the political sphere. We'll talk about all of those as we get into the session. The second session, which will happen on, on March 8th, will be more of an overview of well, 
how does that translate into human rights difficulties in the region? What are the human rights issues? And how has the practice been? Especially in the context of conflict, authoritarianism, and, and challenges of that sort. You know, can we really talk? Can, is it to be assumed that we can only do human rights when you have a governmental system that works? Or when you have peace? or when you have a good judiciary who will really objectively apply the Constitution, when we have a good Constitution, if it's good. So the whole discussion about what are the issues in the region that come out of these uh, challenges would be an important one. The third session on the 29th uh, will be to just look at the local and the global. I mean, the human rights movement is an international movement. When we talk about standards, we talk about international standards. Where, you know, again, how we came to those standards, who decided them, what by, you know, how are they, uh, you know, mandatory? Are they not mandatory, etc.? Uh, is an international system, but how do you negotiate that international standard in local context? What is the relationship between the local and the global in the context of human rights? It's a very interesting discussion that can cover not only the question of. Um, uh, standards and meanings and culture, if you will, and all of that, but also the, the, the questions of networks and power, power relationships even within civil society. You know, when you talk about global civil society, you talk about the international human rights movement, what do you think about Amnesty International Human Rights Watch? Well, there are dozens more at the international level that we actually don't talk about very much, that newspapers don't find it interesting to bring up like Article 19 in London, you know, or the you know, minority rights group, or a whole host of other ones. Well, what about the hundreds? In our region alone, there must be at least 125 to 160 organizations working at national level. Who ever hears of them? So that whole negotiating of the local and the global is a very, very interesting, and I think a very important discussion to have, because the global power uh, imbalance happens not only at governmental level, happens not only at economic development level, it happens also at civil society level. And what does that mean for human rights in the region? And the fourth and last session on April 12th will be just kind of a bit more of a forward-looking, what I propose in the chapter, what I'm asking, actually. It's not really even a proposal, it's more of a question. Is it possible to think about a social movement approach Keeping in mind, uh, as you know, a social movement approach as the next step in human rights advocacy, if you will. Keeping in mind the moral, legal, and political. Keeping in mind the authoritarian and the conflict-ridden difficulties and challenges in the region. Keeping in mind the national and the global relationships. You know, is it an approach? And 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 it all it, it will lead into that question towards the end. And. The last thing I would say now in terms of the study group as a whole is to say this is not a study group where I'm going to sit and lecture you and tell you what it's all about. I'm really hoping that this becomes a proper study group where you can help me think about these issues. Uh, this is the first session, so you know that's fine, but in other sessions, uh, as you think as we think about the topic for the next session. If you can just take a little time, do some search, do some reading, and, and come to each session with some ideas, with some questions, with some challenges, if you will, um, that actually makes it a discussion between us rather than, you know, because, you know, yes, I've been working for 30 years in the region on human rights. It doesn't mean I know everything. And, you know, and your fresh look, your fresh outlook on these issues. Uh, would be very, very helpful in developing thoughts about the future, not for me, but for, for us and, and for the human rights movement uh, in the region. Uh, I do come from a commitment to it. You know, I'm committed to the human rights idea. I think, you know, I think it's valid. I think it's important. And I still think it is probably the cleanest politics you can find, if you can put it that way the cleanest politics you could find, because it is not a politics that seeks power. It is a politics that seeks justice. And there's a huge difference between the two.
So I'm committed to that idea, and I want to see it work in our region as in, in the rest of the world. Okay, this is what we're trying to do with the study group, and, and I hope that we can do it together. Stop. <laughs> <coughs> do you have any thoughts or questions at this point before we actually start to delve into today's topic? One question. Yeah. When we start to define human rights, you will, should I expect or should we expect that we'll have a source that or it's a common basic understanding of human rights and where it actually is coming from based on what you had said, correct? Yeah. Am I correct? Okay. Well, um, no, I said yes, I understand the question. Oh. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't mean so to say that yes, we will. human rights, for example, you know, Latin America has a different understanding of what human rights are. You know, Eastern Europe, same thing. Middle East, they all have what is called an understandable definition of human rights. But if we are specifically talking about Middle East, where would we be deriving our research from in understanding well, human rights? Yeah, I'm a little bit not sure that these different regions have different understandings of human rights. And this is where I say the, the moral, legal, and the political come in. And actually, this is a very good introduction to our discussion today. Um, <laughs> and actually, and I try to tackle this a little bit in, in the chapter, if we should take a, a minute to look at it um, later. Um, the idea here is that, and this is a point I always make, like when I teach workshops and teach about human rights, etc., is that there have been lots of discussion about where do these rights come from? Who says this is a right and this is not, right? And there's a lot of talk about the Magna Carta as an initial human rights document. I personally don't accept that argument. I prefer to go back to Hammurabi's law. There are even documents, depending on which perspective you want to have, there are documents in Pharaonic Egypt that define a relationship between the power and the power, powerful and the powerless in terms of, you know, what is a just measure to ensure that people don't get uh, abused in the exercise of their lives, of their, you know, etc. There's a number of different things. Uh, if you want to look for human rights documents, you can think about the Magna Carta, but you can also think about the Arab pre-Islamic, what's called helpful fudul. Pact of the Notables, which means that you know the notables of Mecca got together and said, "All right, let's pledge to each other not to let anyone who is uh, who has suffered a tyranny continue in that suffering without that tyranny being redressed." You can call that a human rights document. So it depends on on which. My sense and my 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 definition that I always like to say is, regardless of your sources. In the final analysis, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we have today as the mother document and the various human rights treaties are, in fact, political agreements. You know, it's not a question of conviction or faith or feel-good systems, but rather these states as governmental representatives got together and said there is a thing called freedom of expression. There is a thing called freedom of peaceful assembly. They made these definitions and set them out in these treaties and accepted the idea that they should become treaties and that states voluntarily, nobody twists their arms to go and sign and ratify those treaties and commit themselves to it. So this is politics. This is not, you know, faith and, you know, God gave us these rights or God did not give us these rights. You've already agreed. If you don't want to sign the agreement, don't sign it. Right? If you don't, if you are not, if you don't want to be part of the discussion and debate on the definition of those rights, as you will see in the, in the Truffaut Preparatoire for all of these various uh, agreements, uh, some states were very involved, other states less involved, but in the end, a text comes out as a political agreement. So I, might, I prefer to say it's there. So the moral, ethical argument for human rights, you can come at from different perspectives. 
And in our region, and that this would be a good way to begin, if you will, in our region, and as, as many of you here are from the region, um, that's been a contentious debate, right? We don't need this neo 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 sorry neo colonial Western liberal democratic discourse called human rights. We have Islam and Islamic Sharia, and for us, rights are given by God, not by other men. Focus on men, right? <laughs> So that has been a contentious debate. And that has actually defined for a lot of people in the region the slowness of governmental acceptance of their human rights obligations. So let's talk about that a little bit. Do people have any, any specific thoughts on that, on that specific area of the moral, ethical sources of rights and perspectives in the region? Uh, things that you have read, things that you have experienced yourselves, either going to the region or being involved in the region. Uh, otherwise, I'll tell you what I think. I, I, I think I just want to clarify, just, yeah. I don't know if anybody else is struggling with it, but um, so you're saying because it's based on a religious background that it's slower motion for civil rights. No, because, because the choice of looking at it from a religious perspective could slow it down, okay. which it has in some countries, not in all countries, in some countries. Okay. And I'll, I'll come to explain that a bit more later. Uh, so in other words, many people, including a lot of Western writers, write about human rights as based in Judeo-Christian ethic, in liberal democratic, you know, post-enlightenment, Westphalian uh, approach to, to, to society. But that's an interpretation, that's a perspective, right? For me, it doesn't matter. My perspective is that it doesn't matter. Once it's become an agreement, then it becomes legally binding. Once you sign and ratify it, then you need to perform your obligation per that contractual agreement to do what the treaty says you must do. Okay, So here you have this, this tension going on between, uh, you know, in, and I keep wanting to bring it back to the region because that's what, what we're really trying to understand here. Um, if we, okay, initially, Arab states, most of them, said, well, you know, this has nothing really to do much with us. You know, when they adopted the Universal Declaration, there were only 50 states members of the 50-some uh, of the United Nations when there was UDHR was adopted in the UN. Saudi Arabia was a member. It abstained. It didn't vote for it, but it didn't vote against it. It abstained, basically on the idea that we don't really need it. If you want to have it, you can have it. We don't need it. We have Islamic Sharia. As the human rights paradigm grew internationally and the pressure increased on states in the region to be thinking and dealing with these issues in the late 70s, 80s, uh, it became evident that they needed to do, to do something. So they, they adopted the uh, Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam, where they basically interpreted uh, Islam from a, their understanding of Sharia, Islamic Sharia law, and say, this is what we understand with human rights. It was a nice public relations affair that actually didn't go very far. A, they didn't translate it into any kind of commitment they didn't make much use of it other than maybe just a reference here and there. Oh yeah, but we don't have it, etc. And they were criticized very severely for it by the Arab human rights activists before the international human rights activists criticized them. So that, obviously, that public relations attempt did not reduce the pressure on them. So what did they do? They got together again in the Arab League that one was adopted by the Organization of the Islamic Conference. 
They went to the Arab League and they adopted the Arab Charter for Human Rights in 1994 as a legally binding document to be signed and ratified by the Arab states. So we have an Arab Charter for Human Rights in 1994. Nobody signed it and nobody ratified it. But this is yours. It is below international standards. It is below international standards. It still says Sharia is basically superior to international law and all of that, which is understandable. Why didn't you ratify it? So obviously there was a political non-intention to actually do anything about it. So you use the excuse of having your own cultural specificity, your own faith-based systems, that you don't really need all this other stuff that's coming from somewhere else, but then you still don't do anything about it. You still don't make use of it for the betterment of people's lives in your own societies. Still the pressure did not abate. Ten years later, they took, took the charter off the shelf, dusted the, you know, wiped the dust off, and renegotiated it, rewrote it, and put it out for adoption, and now it is in force. But only about half of the states, a little more than half, have now uh, signed and ratified it. And they've established a committee. Now here's the thing. For all of the moral, ethical, cultural objections to an international standards that the Arab slash Islamic states have or had, they are now fully engaged in the international human rights system. They go to, I'm Saudi Arabia is, is, is a member of the Human Rights Council, you know, they're doing all the stuff, they're sending all the reports, and I did you know, a good bit of research on, on trying to understand to what degree they, they, they are. They've established national human rights institutions in 15, I believe, 15, now maybe 16 countries of the, two, of the 22 countries, members of the Arab League. These are state-sponsored institutions that are supposed to oversee the enjoyment of human rights by citizens. They've um, established higher councils for women, higher councils for children. They've been working on plans to implement the UN Security Council, uh, UN Security Council Resol Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. Uh, they're, they're having all of this flurry of activities in the last 10 to 15 years to be fully engaged in the international human rights system. So, in that sense, for me then, the, the cultural specificity argument or the Arab region's understanding of human rights is beside the point, which takes us to the next level, and the next question. Is it serious? Are they seriously uh, engaging in the human rights idea and the human rights system in a set of international and now regional standards for human rights, regardless of some gaps in between the two. Okay. Um, so is it serious? To what degree is it serious? Is a big question. Let me say, let me, let me add two thoughts to, to this discussion. It's good. Um, one is, um, what change are we expecting? And I think you're absolutely right if we're expecting that human rights are gonna, going to produce revolution. But not, yeah. not in that sense. Right. So the entire system is going to go ups upside down and turned over, in, 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 turning a new leaf over entirely just because uh, Saudi Arabia has a National Commission for Human Rights now, or because Egypt has a National Council for Human Rights, etc. So that's not going to happen. But at the same time, Tara is right in the sense that in certain issues deemed safe by the authorities, and each and everybody in their country know exactly where the red lines are, right? Uh, you can get some incremental change 
as a result of the work of these institutions. Give you a little bit. I'm a member, I've always been a, a, a pusher for national human rights institutions. I think that's a good idea. Even though most of them in the region are below international standards, they're not really entirely independent from the government, from the executive authority, etc. Uh, but I think still is, in the same way that Tari was saying, is, is a good idea. Uh, I'm a member of the Palestinian National Human Rights Institution. We don't even have a state yet. I mean, we do have a state, but it's not independent yet. <laughs> it's not out of occupation yet. But so, and just recently, even under occupation, there was the case of a writer who the executive authority didn't like what he wrote, and I can't remember the name. Sharima Firamallah. Oh, the writer. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the novel was called uh, Crime in Ramallah, mm -hmm. right? And uh, all the books were taken off the shelves and prohibited and et cetera, et cetera. And the, the Palestinian National Human Rights Commission went to the government and said, this is unacceptable. This is a violation of your own treaties that you have recently signed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so now some redress seems to be beginning to happen as a result of the work of the National Human Rights Institution. So... Again, in places like Qatar, which has a commission as well, and Saudi Arabia, you will find incremental progress in terms of protection of women, for example, in certain cases. You will find you know, domestic workers being protected by these institutions in certain cases. There are some, some positive thing comes out. But again, you're absolutely right, it doesn't resolve the human rights issues that are fundamentally a problem. The other th thing I wanted to point out to is in terms of that willingness to engage, that willingness to uh, you know, establish institutions and sign treaties and, and, and actually send reports to the Human Rights Council and receive back reports and make interventions. And I actually you know, did a fairly thorough studies of that and I came to the conclusion that They've decided that instead of what they tried to do in the, with Islam and human rights, and etc., uh, they've decided to engage the system to play the game. But they are actually playing not to lose. Not to win, but they're playing in order not to lose, in order not to be told that they are out of the game, not to be told that they are abusers. No, no, here we are, and we're doing it, and here's the report. We, how dare you call us abusers? We, we published our report. We gave it to the Human Rights Council. So they're playing that game, they're seeing it as a game, and they're playing it in order not to lose the human rights game. And that's actually part of the, the title of, the, of a chapter in another book that came out on, on the UN in the Arab region called The Land of Blue Helmets that just came out as well. Which is the quality of the reports that they produce and the type of cases that they review, if yeah. any. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about. I right, know right, that sure, it sure. It doesn't elevate to the level that sure. we all aspire to. Yeah. But I don't yeah. know if you have observed. You know. Yeah, no, I'm I'm actually pretty familiar with uh, with them and their work in the sense that you have to look at how they're structured and what their mandates are, and it's different in every country at different degrees. Mm -hmm. They are all mandated to promote human rights, to so they're all engaged in human rights education. That in itself is a very positive thing. That means the general population, whether it's in schools or universities, you know, are beginning to, to, be, to be able to talk about human rights in an accepted fashion because they're part of a program that was sponsored by this national institution, etc. Um, most of them, actually all of them with a few exceptions, I should say, uh, have the authority to receive complaints from citizens. You know, I was fired from my job, I had, you know, pension, etc., and I was denied that pension, you know, help me. So it becomes like an ombudsman office for um, citizen complaints. And much of that works very well. And they actually, well, I don't know very well, I, I, can't, I haven't studied enough to say very well. <laughs> Most of that seems to be working, let me say, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, people, uh, that those institutions are willing to resolve individual cases. Very few of them have any mandate to report publicly. So you see how it begins to work. Mm 
Yes, we'll work on human rights. We'll help you if you have a little trouble. We'll take care of this problem between you and your employer. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with the question of child abuse there, etc. But we're not going to publicly talk about the kinds of human rights problems we have in our country. Then it's political. That part of it then becomes political. They will not engage in the politics of naming and shaming that uh, non-governmental human rights organizations do. Dr. Hassan, can I challenge what you, yes. what you said about the fact that they decided to play the game, yeah. not to lose? Are there any ramifications for that? Just no, to not really. That idea. Yeah. Do you think that, or anybody thinks that there would be ramifications for that? There are no ramifications for it. Because when you look at it, the international human rights system entirely has no enforcement mechanism. You cannot force any state to implement. You cannot force the United States to stop drone attacks and extrajudicial killings. You can't. Well, if they've decided they're going to do it, they're doing it. And even if it is named and shamed as a violation of human rights, as, a summary, as an exercise in summary executions, Right? There's no uh, sanctions that can be imposed through the human rights system. It has to go to the political body of the UN to decide on these things, which is the Security Council, one of the most undemocratic institutions in the UN. Right? So, I mean, this is the reality. The only, in all of the, if you look at the whole panoply of human rights globally, there's only one institution that you can go to for deeply serious, massive and systematic and gross human rights violations, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. These are it. That's the only institution in the international system that has, you know, uh, that is of a judicial nature to adjudicate violations and sanctions two things about the International Criminal Court. I'm glad we have it, but don't get too excited. It is a treaty, which means if I don't want to sign the Rome Statutes that establish the, the ICC, I don't accept the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court to deal with my citizens. The U.S. was one of the main discussants to promulgate the treaty and pulled out as soon as George W. Bush was elected, right? Um, the, the second thing is, is that, um, uh, what was the second thing? I can't remember. ICC? Yeah, the ICC. That it's, a, that it's a treaty, you know, first of all. And second of all, the decision to move cases, in other words, to push cases through the prosecution is, again, can be brought forward by states that are members of the ICC treaty, okay, if they have particular material damage, meaning their own citizens, or it happened on their territory. But if you're not a member of the ICC, you can't go talk to them, period. NGOs can go and present and push for investigations, as four Palestinian organizations did, uh, and went and, and, and presented a full dossier of, of, of crimes against humanity and war crimes in the, in the onslaught on Gaza, 2014. Right? But it's up to the prosecutor to, see, to decide whether or not to initiate an investigation. Or, or NGOs can push another state party to do the of same course. thing. So yeah. any state party can yeah. refer a situation even if it didn't impact them. So like Sweden could refer a situation that happened in literally any other party that's any other state that's party yeah. to the Rome statute. So yeah. So I mean these are these are the limitations of the only enforcement mechanism we have for international human rights and humanitarian law. Now, there was a mechanism within humanitarian law, within the Geneva Conventions, within what are called grave breaches of the Convention. You know, <clears throat> if you're a party to the Convention, and almost all states are parties to the Geneva Conventions, 
you have the authority to try in your own courts under a universal jurisdiction crimes against humanity and great breaches of the, of the Geneva Conventions. But no states have done that. You know, Nuremberg was the first such case that kind of ran into a series of uh, you know, ad hoc tribunals like the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, etc., until the ICC was established. Now that the ICC is established, nobody even thinks and talks about universal jurisdiction prosecutions. So anyway, this, this gets a bit too, too detailed for, for our discussion. But it, is, it goes to, to the point that the ramifications of playing the game in order not to lose as a game are zero. The implications are zero. So then what is left? We'll go into the other sessions, you know, about well, what can be done about all of this, right? So, but I'm also interested in, in that whole idea about the moral legal and political discourses. Uh, and let me pose it as a question. When countries in the Middle East and North Africa say that we don't really need this human rights thing because we have Sharia law, but then they go ahead and they sign international human rights treaties, some with reservations, like, you know, Interestingly, there's almost universal ratification of the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in the Arab region. Almost universal ratification. I think it's only Somalia and the Comoros that have not ratified it. Hmm? Anybody else? Just Somalia and the Comoros, I think. Right? So where, <laughs> where are women's rights? If this is the situation, you know, the, the panacea of having signed a treaty doesn't necessarily mean that we have improvement on the ground, right? So is that because, in other words, the, the discourses I'm talking about is that that argument about Sharia goes out the window once you've, satis once you've signed the, the treaty. It becomes a legal obligation. But it doesn't quite go out the window because you can put in reservations. You can say, well, you know, I'm not going to implement these articles because for us, Islamic Sharia, Sharia says otherwise. And they've undermined some of the provisions. Not all countries have, but about half of the countries that have signed the, the CEDAW Convention have actually made reservations to, to be not committed to certain articles of the convention. Right? Once they sign it, it becomes a matter of law. And you can sit there and do legal analysis until you're blue in the face about the nature of the state's obligation under international contractual law to do this, this, and that, and the other thing. Right? But fundamentally, the decision to implement and enforce the CEDAW Convention, for example, is political. And it crosses over the culture in some ways but it has to be a decision to say, yes, we are not going to, we are going to allow women to drive in Saudi Arabia. We are going to pass domestic violence laws that look at domestic violence as any other assault on physical integrity of any person, period. That's a political decision. Um, what do you think will affect the political decision to implement or not implement a human rights treaty obligation. I'm wondering if one of the reasons these countries are not held to account for playing the game is economics in the reverse, meaning, you know, not so much that you can use economic leverage to enforce upon them certain modes of behavior as, as uh, you know, he was suggesting, but rather you don't enforce that because your own economic interests, I mean, think about this, the billions upon billions of dollars that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the Emirates have invest, invested in Europe and in North America, mm -hmm. that by itself 
can be an answer to, you know. When you think about the lucrative deals that Halliburton did right after the invasion of Iraq, not only in Iraq, but all across the region, when you think about the relationship between the Bushes as a <coughs> dynasty and, and Saudi Arabia, you begin to see, oh, you know, wait a minute. The noises that were made uh, by Congress about, you know, this, this recent law that was passed on, on you know, punishing um, those that were involved in 9-11, basically essentially going to Saudi Arabia, you know, half of, more than half of the attackers in 9-11 were Saudis, Saudi nationals. Um, Saudi Arabia, the first thing it did was say, we're going to pull out all of our money if this thing goes through. Right? So you begin to see a kind of a, the political economy of power and authority that will affect directly to what degree you are willing to engage with states on their behavior. And that also could answer some of the question that you were having. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Now, the thing with the ICC and war crimes is that Syria is not a party to the ICC. Even if it's a party, it doesn't matter. For <laughs> yeah, well, that's something else, yeah. By the way, I just wanted to add one other thing. I don't accept anymore. I mean, that might have been the case in the 70s or 60s. But I don't accept anymore the idea of the developed and underdeveloped world. That somehow if we're underdeveloped, and then the developed world has to teach us things. I don't think that's been an issue for at least 20 to 30 years. I think the real issue is what kind of ha what, what is happening at the economic and political level, especially after globalization and, and the neoliberal policies of globalization and how it has affected the global power relationships, the, the role of the multinationals and the role of, of the global power elites, including the IMF, the G7, and the G20, and all of that, you know. And part of that, includes the elites in the so-called underdeveloped countries. Another part of that question is, what's the alternative? Yeah. Right. Right? I mean, you know, these are all valid points. But the question of alternative is, is very serious in the sense that um, at this point, for actors on the ground, they don't have any tool by which they can advocate for their immediate needs, framed as rights, if you will, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other than going out on the streets or relying on the system to try and get something out of it. And the system in most of the countries of the region are, uh, oh yeah, I know my cousin works with somebody who knows somebody in the Ministry of uh, Health uh, and Education or whatever, you know, and you know, we can try and get that done. Or the system of corruption and bribes, bribes and all of that. And that's just a self-perpetuating, uh, you know, it's, it perpetuates the problem and doesn't solve much. The only other option is what they tried to do with the, with the Arab revolts in 2011. When things reach such a terrible level that people, you know, can't take it anymore and all it takes is a little spark for, you know, thousands of people to hit the streets. But mobilization of that sort can be very heady, and I know we all got excited. Change is coming, finally. <clears throat> but mobilization of that sort is not long-term. It's not strategic. It's immediate, it's reactionary, it's, it's honest, it's true, but it's not strategic. It doesn't have a plan. Well, I mean, this whole thing about this, yeah, yeah, yeah. This whole thing about the safe zones is not new. They've been talking about it since day one, yeah. right? And the Saudis have always been supportive of a of a no-fly zone, of a of a safe zone, from the first day that they sent the joint representative of the Arab League and the UN. Um, so, I don't think anybody pushed the Saudis to do this, and I don't think that's an outcome of a change in policy in the U.S. after the Trump administration came in. So I'm not sure that that is, you know, uh, that connection is, is there to oh, make. There have been official talks between Trump's 
people yeah, as there have been between the Saudis and other administrations in the past. Yeah, the problem with that, I mean, Obama really seriously considered the, uh, the you know, no-fly zone and the safe zone in Syria. The Europeans really wanted it because it might help then stem the flow of refugees into Europe, which are suffering a lot more than the U.S. ever dreamed of, you know, with, with uh, you know, refugees. But the problem is not whether or not Saudis or the Qataris or others would accept. It was never that. It was the problem of whether the Russians would accept. You know, right now the most dangerous thing about Russian involvement on the ground in Syria is the potential for a broader regional war if the U.S. or, you know, Turkey or, or any of the... I mean, everybody and their cousin has got fighting forces in Syria right now. You know, God help us. So this is really the, the real fear that had stopped any kind of discussion about safety zones in Syria from going forward. You know, the refugee issue in, in Syria is a huge, a huge one. You know, and unless things stop and people are able to go back, and I am positive most Syrians want to go back home, you know, but they cannot go back home with the situation as it is, and not only because of war. But if it promises to be a continuation of the previous order, why would I go home if this can happen again, unless the order changes, right? So, I mean, this is a huge, huge uh, arena. But I want to take issue with, with I'm hoping, the slip of the tongue, unless it is a real understanding that people have. The idea that, and I think I sense that understanding from you as well, that somehow... The international human rights system is a Western system. It's not. I don't believe it is. Right? I mean, you mentioned the Western human rights system. Yeah, I mean, so I was... I, you, I don't mean... I was not... No, I'm not, I'm not accusing. I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, that there is... I just want to catch that conception Actually, and, a lot and of keep... A lot of people same. believe that, yeah. absolutely. Especially in the region. That's why I wanted to, to, uh, to bring it up, you know. In fact... When do you see Americans actually think about human rights in terms of their own society? Mass incarceration. Hmm? Mass incarceration would probably be the most... Yeah, but they don't use human rights language. They talk about the Constitution. For Americans, the U.S. Constitution is above international law even. You know, and that's a... You know, so they don't need the, the international human rights system. Right? Uh, same in Europe. In Europe, they have a European Convention for Human Rights. In the U.S., they have an Inter-American Convention for Human Rights that nobody hardly ever uses within the U.S. or Canada context because they have a system that a judicial system and a constitutional system that seems to work for the most part. For the most part. Let me, let me finish that thought. We're all getting excited. Right? <laughs> and, and that brings me to, to something I wanted to raise about the region. If we think about human rights, you're talking about law. You're not talking about values and feelings, right? You're talking about law. You're talking about, I have a right to uh, uh, an affordable health system. What does that mean? It means somebody has an obligation to ensure that I can have an affordable health care system, right? Which means that, you know, in the human rights language, what we refer to is there are rights holders, which are all of us, and there are duty bearers, which are usually the government. If the government doesn't provide this right, ensure its respect, ensure its fulfillment, then it has to has also the legal responsibility to create an environment within which I can exercise that right. So in other words, there is a right to work in the human rights system. That doesn't mean the government has an obligation to provide work for everybody. But it means it has an obligation to create an environment where people can exercise having at least equal access to work opportunities, access to equal pay for equal work, and, and, and all of the complications and and, and, and details of what it means to have a right to work. Right? In the region, the law is really 
really shabby. I mean, at all levels. I mean, that's the best way I can... Shabby. I can, shabby. I wasn't going to say... I wasn't going to say shabby, but that No, was, no, no, yeah. no. You have to be careful. The, it, is, it is a very law-based system, but it's the difference between the rule of law and the law of rules. Where you live by a set of rules that are not defined by principles about what it means to have the rule of law. Uh, I'll give you one, one little example. The first obligation, usually in the very first articles or even in the preambles of international human rights agreements, is that as soon as the country ratifies an agreement, its first obligation is to harmonize its domestic law with its international human rights, with its international treaty obligations whether it's human rights or the law of the sea or trade law or whatever. You cannot have a contradiction between what you've committed to internationally and a domestic law that doesn't let you do it. So you have to harmonize your domestic law with your international treaty obligations. Most states in the region that have signed all of those international human rights treaties don't do that. They don't do that. But that's what different. I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 if you've different. signed, if you've signed the international covenant on civil and political rights, yeah. right? You have to go back to your domestic law and fix your penal codes and fix your civil codes and, and all the other laws that you have to ensure that they are not in contradiction with your obligations under the covenant. Is that part that's of what they have not yeah. done? Yeah, exactly. So that's what they have not done. Yeah, so you've got and this two is the yeah. Then you have another level. Even when they have done, to a degree, some of that, and I'll give you another example in a minute, mm -hmm. uh, who adjudicates but judges, right? Judges yeah. sit there and say, this is a violation, this is not a violation. Yes, you are right, no, you are wrong, right? Uh, are judges, including in this country, ever objective? Are judges ever, uh, do, I mean, do they have always the, the clarity of intellect and knowledge of the law to be able to adjudicate properly on law? I'll give you an example. This is one of the issues, one of the problematics in my mind of human rights law, as in any other law. An example, the, all the debates about who is going to be appointed to the Supreme Court. Why is that? I'm appointing a conservative judge, I'm appointing a liberal judge. Because law is about interpretation. It's not about just text. Texts don't live. People interpret texts. Judges interpret texts. Sharia judges interpret texts. That's why you have four uh, schools of, of Islamic jurisprudence. And they don't agree on all matters. Right? So this is the kind of legal limbo we are living in. We are subject to these kinds of, of interpretations. Mm -hmm. um, what was the example? I was going to mention another example, but this one came up and took, took it over. Um, yeah. Some years ago, in the mid-90s, I did a study on Arab constitutional protection of civil and political rights. Okay? I wanted to study the Arab constitutions and see what they say about civil and political rights, not even dealing with the economic and social elements, just those. Because at that time, we were all talking about democratizations and you know, you know, pushing democracy in the Arab region. And you know, so you have to look at, and again, the beginnings of, we're still, well, it wasn't the beginning, but uh, anyway. Uh, and I discovered something very interesting. In fact, most Arab constitutions at the time and of course, there, there's been many amendments since. The new constitution in Tunisia now, you know, big amendments in Morocco. I mean, every other year, some constitution gets amended. But at that time, I found that, in fact, in the rights and liberties chapter in the constitutions, almost all of them were great. They were very clear. The people are the source of all authority in our country. No, including the Syrian constitution. Sure. The people are the sole authority, right? 
and people have people are equal before the law no exceptions to that people are equal before law on the basis of sex and and you know and, and uh, national origin and you no know, discrimination on the basis of uh, you know social status or all of these things were there but all of these personal civil rights and political rights and liberties are to be organized or systematized in law Aha. first step the legislator goes to take that uh, constitutional provision guaranteeing freedom of expression, for example, and sets up in the penal law uh, protections, and in the civil law, protections on uh, freedom of expression. You discover in the actual law that half of the right is actually taken away because it will say things like the Minister of Information has the right to just come in and stop uh, a newspaper if he feels that you know, it is uh, in harming the national interest without defining what the national interest is. So you begin to reduce the level of protection, the degree of right that you have for these rights through the legal organizing of those rights. Then each law, once it's passed, needs to have executive regulations, right? With the executive regulations, another two-thirds of what's left by the law in terms of the rights is taken away. And then you have maybe about 10% of it left for on the practice level, and that is taken away in implementation on the ground. Once you go to the judge or once you go to the uh, person behind the window who's, who's uh, you know, thing, and they say, you know, look, I'll put your, your uh, case on top of my list here, you know, for $1,000. Or, you know, for a thousand, I'll guarantee your judgment over here. I mean, and then it just goes on. So whatever is left in practice is destroyed. So in effect, there is no enjoyment of civil and political liberties, even though the constitutions are perfect. It's what it means to me is that there's a big gap between rhetoric and reality uh, in the region. You know, we're very good at rhetoric. We love oratory and, you know, Arabic is beautiful language. And, you, know, love, you know, we do it in poetry and, you know. But uh, in reality, on the ground, implementation is another method altogether. That's basically what, what it means. You know? But that also bring, brings to my mind, I mean, that's why I raise the question, you know, when I talk about the moral, legal, and political discourses of human rights, you know, the question in my mind is, are they necessarily in conflict with one another? Because a lot of the critique that we've seen and there's been a growing critique of human rights by, from various circles, mostly in the West, by the way. There's always been some critique from a, you know, an Islamist perspective or you know, an Asian values perspective. You know, if you remember, you know, some years ago, there was a big debate that we don't need human rights, we have Asian values. Okay? To talk about India and China and, and Malaysia and these countries. Um, so oftentimes, that you will critique the human rights system, like we say, well, these are Western values anyway. Well, what kind of, is that a, 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 an ethic, a moral, cultural argument, or is it a legal argument, or is it a political argument? Um, when you say your country is obligated under international law to implement one, two, three, right? That's a legal discussion. But then you say, no, I'm not going to implement one, two, three, because this international, this human rights system is a Western construct, and I have nothing to do with it. I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, but the country is signed and ratified. Yeah, so what? And here you have a judge saying that. So here are the kinds of, you know, the critiques that kind of mix up the fields. Yeah, we can talk about sources of rights until we're blue in the face, right? Or as we say in Arabic, until we grow hair on our tongues. <laughs> <laughs> right, but in the end, you have the law. But then the law isn't doesn't seem to be working, which means you have the politics, and within the politics, I would also include economics, and that's what I'm beginning to to go into much more now is what you raised, Manel, which is the idea that it's it, you know to really understand why and why not 
in terms of human rights practice, we have to look at the political economy of human rights, especially issues of power, the relationship of economic power to political power, and whether or not in our region legal power can have anything to influence those two. You know, and that's a big question, right? And the last piece of that equation is, of course, people power. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough one because in some ways, when you look at the systems of governance in the region, they're actually secular. They're not religious at all, except for some countries like Saudi Arabia. And, you know, uh, yes, in most constitutions and most of the constructs of the, of the country, they say that, you know, Sharia is the major or the, you know, or an important source of legislation in the country. Even they say, you know, Islam is the religion of the state kind of thing, right? But in effect, penal law, civil law, etc., do not reflect necessarily Sharia principles. Otherwise, why do you need a judicial system? Under traditional, uh, you know, Sharia law, you just need a Sharia judge. A judge that will just tell you what, you know, his interpretation of Sharia is. You are referring to the republics that are secular systems. Even the kingdoms, even the kingdoms, Morocco. Uh, other know? than Saudi Arabia and other Islamic. Well, I'm just saying that Saudi Arabia has a particular place. Mm -hmm. You know, like for example, um, no, I mean the laws even in Qatar and the Emirates are very secular. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain areas of interpretation where they say, you know, okay, this is informed by Sharia. But in fact, it's not Sharia law being applied in the courts. It is the actual, you know, penal law and the civil codes and the, you know, the you know labor codes and labor laws and all of that. They've set up all of the system. So Saudi Arabia recently, recently about ten years ago, actually for the first time established a three-tier judicial system. They used to rely only on Sharia judges, but Saudi Arabia sees itself differently from the rest of the world. They are the, you know, the guardians of the two mosques. It's the birth of Islam. And they have, you know, they speak on behalf of Muslims. They are absolutely convinced that they speak on behalf of all Muslims in the world. You know, so, but even they, you know, even, you know, you have to get detailed in order to, you know, unpack this and, and you don't really can't get into that level of detail now, and I don't know all of it myself. But um, you know. Shall I change the question to: Do you think the religious authorities' influence on people has something to do with? No, I don't. Instead of I, my initial yeah. question was: Do you think the fact that we don't have secular systems, and you answered it, and then I yeah, know, I said I think we do, and. Yes, in some circles there may be. You know, for example, the growth of uh, the Islamist populist movements in the last 20 years mm -hmm. is largely due, due to the influence of Wahhabi education mm -hmm. and the fact that you know, in Islam anybody with a you know, gift for oratory can set up their own little mosque in a corner of the street. Nobody will prevent you from doing that. Now they're doing laws to prevent people. So, um, you know, they, you know, these Islamist movements, you know, like the Brotherhood in Egypt and, and, and many of the others, including in Nahda, would include, including Hamas and, and Hezbollah. They would use education and health care and services to, you know, bring people into the fold. You know, and I remember very well in Palestine, you know, that when the Hamas was just beginning, Hamas wasn't even a power yet. We're talking about, you know, 82, 83, right? or 81 maybe, uh, they would organize football matches for the children. And just at the end of the match, they would stand together in line and pray. And say, wait a second, I've never seen that happen before. Right? So, yes, there is an influence, uh, but whether that influence is, is destructive, constructive, you know, it's, it's in, the, in each uh, context, very clearly. Yeah, and I think one of the, one of the big challenges for, for uh, social movements in the region, if you will, is 
the threat that's always been posed about do you want more freedom or do you want stability? And that's been the biggest question for people. Hmm? If you don't support the status quo, everything will be chaos. And the viciousness with which the existing ruling regimes have defended their positions and their authority and their power uh, essentially has said, I mean, right now I can go to any citizen in the Arab region and say, look, do you want stability like Saudi Arabia and, you know, uh, Qatar? They're very stable countries. Or do you want Yemen and Syria and Libya and Iraq or Lebanon in the civil war? Do you want chaos? We are the only guardians against chaos. This has been the argument that's been uh, put out a great deal. And it still has currency. And now probably it has even more currency. And it was used in the, in the 80s and actually used more in the 90s that if you vote for Islamist parties, you will get chaos. You know, If you don't support Hosni Mubarak, you're going to get the Islamic Brotherhood in chaos. They didn't even, they weren't even given a chance to fail. <laughs> so the military coup took over and, and drove them out. But they were failing so badly. It was so clear, clear as sun. But the interest was not in letting them fail and revamp democratic processes to express the will of the people. The interest was in maintaining power. The military came right back in and took the power back. That's basically what happened. So that's the debate in my mind, you know, and, and, and that's the threat. Um, if you talk to people in terms that are not highly volatile terms like Islam, human rights even, you know, or democracy, if you talk to them about life, about needs, about family, about children, about work, about food. They all speak human rights language entirely. I should be able to have the right to go to the window and get my, uh, you know, get my license without having to bribe anybody. They all know that. And this is the, the, the gap we need to find a way to bridge. How do we bridge what people understand in their gut to be a human rights demand, to demand, Policies. you know, from their government, from their systems, you know. But as soon as they frame it in human rights terms, suddenly it starts to take on all this other baggage, Sharia and Islam and Western colonialism and, and what have you, you know. So I am convinced that change can only happen from within. It cannot be imposed from the outside. It cannot even be suggested from the outside. I think right now we, we even no longer need to think about the national level as the arena for change. I think we need to think about the global level as an arena for change. Because what keeps those elites in power is not only a national system of corruption and military and what have you. It's a global international financial and military elite, and that's that's there. I know it sounds a little bit, uh, you know, conspiracy-minded, but I think that's why we need to look at political economy, and that's why we need to look at, you know, following the money, and you know, how does the power affect who has the money, and that requires a very different kind of research. It seems to me, uh, we need to be able to tie in financial transactions military sales, yes. weapons sales, um, you know, industrial multinational corporations and what they're doing in their relationships at national levels in different countries with actual events taking place. Think about the Dakota pipeline, right? 
I mean, you're talking about, you know, Native Americans being, you know, basically deprived of their, you know, uh, water resources and, 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 and access to, to ancestral land, spiritual value, freedom of religion. I mean, you just name a whole bunch of things, you know. But that pipe was going to be built. Uh, so there are, you know, these kinds of connections that need to be made that might help us understand, A, really why it happens, and we don't fall into what another writer here, uh, Abul Fadl, Khaled Abul Fadl, wrote a very good chapter here on Islamic interpretation, on Islam and Islamic Sharia and human rights. Very interesting. You know, he says, avoiding the culturalist interpretations of what's going on. It's a good term, I thought, you know, uh, because culturalist can easily just slip into racist. Well, you know, these people culturally are not like that. I mean, you know, they are underdeveloped. <laughs> or, you know, hey, you know, after all, Islam hasn't gone through a reformation like Christianity has gone through in the, you know, 300 years ago. You know. Well, I mean, that's true, but also, I mean, Europe was in blood up its up to its knees for 300 years before that thing come down. <laughs> you know, that reformation come down. You know, maybe we're doing the same. Who knows? There. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you know, but I mean, there are some, a lot of really interesting thoughts on this, you know. So, as we move forward with, the, with this study group and thinking about, okay, this kind of, I've, I really enjoyed or jumping around on the, between the moral, legal, and, and the political discourses. We are going to do an over, on, for the next session on the 8th, overview of human rights issues and practice in the context of conflict, authoritarianism, and other challenges. And here we're talking about examples in the region, but I'm more interested in thinking about uh, can one do human rights work in the midst of conflict? There's always been a debate about human rights law and humanitarian law, meaning during times of armed conflict, humanitarian law kicks in. Uh, the wisdom is now humanitarian law kicks in, but human rights law does not kick out, right? If there is uh, a commitment within Syria, which is a, a party to the international covenants, for example, such as it was, that commitment, uh, and now we can judge what's happening in Syria on the basis of humanitarian law because there is an internal armed conflict going on. That doesn't mean that, you know, the government's commitment to implement the human rights law stops. So, but that is interesting in, when you ask the question, yeah, but is humanitarian law even getting implemented? You know, where does it fit? It's not just a debate between human rights law and humanitarian law. Now we're talking about international criminal law because you're talking about war crimes and crimes against humanity going on in the Syrian context, but also in the Yemeni context. And here I'm not only talking about Saudi bombings and killing civilians and all of that. I'm also talking about so many executions through pilotless drones. You know, I'm also talking about you know laying siege and and and, uh, and starvation. Children in Yemen are starving to <coughs> death. Very serious. Libya, I don't know what haven't followed recently, but seems to have calmed down a little bit, but the country is divided. There's no sense of unity in the country, right? South Sudan, it's not over. At first it was like, no, oh, it's the Christians and the Muslims and the Arab North and the, you know, African South and they're all fighting, etc. We have to split, and they split. No sooner did they split, than the South, South Sudanese started fighting each other. So it's not really about culturalist interpretations. It's not really about the Arabs of the North and the, and the animus of Darfur, Africans in Darfur, or the Africans in, in South Sudan. It's about who's controlling the oil fields in Sudan, and a number of other things, right? So we need to look at these issues and how, how conflict affects our understanding of human rights and affects how we use 
how we use human rights, you know, and from that extrapolating some of the major human rights issues. Some of those issues are an, a clear outcome of the conflict, but really a huge amount of, of huge number of the human rights issues are, have been persistent long before the conflict and may have even caused the conflict, which is the other question. To what degree can human rights abuses cause internal armed conflict, at least, if not international armed conflict? So these are our questions for, for next, uh, next time.